Hi, my name is Mary Reed. I'm the Chief Apiary Inspector for the Texas Apiary Inspection Service. Today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the current beekeeping laws we have here in Texas, uh, but I'd also like to give you a little bit more of a background about our office and some of the other activities that we do. So to start off, just to give you a little introduction into the history of our office, we were first established in 1910 and the reason our office was, was created was because there was Texas legislature enacted to control and suppress American foul brood, which is a really problematic disease for beekeepers. It was especially so at that time, um, but we, it still exists today, and it's something that we still look for. It wasn't until 1920 that we got our first chief inspector. And our office is actually housed underneath the Texas A&M University system. It's a little atypical for a government agency to be underneath a university. Typically, they would be under the Department of Agriculture. But we are housed here uh, with the university. And the really great thing about it is that Texas A&M is a land-grant university. We have the entomology department here with us. So if there's any issues that we see out in the field, we have a great group of entomologists that we can turn to to ask questions um, and maybe to spur on some new research ideas. Texas is not the only state that has an apiary inspection service. Um, quite a few states in the, in the U.S. have some type of apiary inspection service. Um, for the most part, or all of them, um, were at least first created to combat American foul brood. And across the board, um, states were largely successful in their efforts. Um, many states um, still continue to monitor for American foul brood, um, but with the introduction of all sorts of other different pests and diseases, um, we have also turned our attention to these other issues. Many state inspection services are part of a organization called the Apiary Inspectors of America. And this not only includes inspection services from the United States, but also uh, Canada. And it's a great way for inspection services to stay in communication with each other throughout the course of the year, um, discuss any issues that they may see popping up in their states. And we are also uh, actually actively involved in other nonprofit organizations and other areas of discussion about honeybees and, and bee health. So for our office here in Texas, we created a mission statement um, in which we emphasized the techniques that we use to safeguard the apiary industry. And it's in combination with the application of science-based regulations, utilizing educational opportunities, and then of course maintaining open communication with the, with the industry, not only with the apiary industry, but with the agricultural industry as a whole. So in Texas, we have our Texas Agriculture Code, and specifically we have our laws are Chapter 131, Bees and Honey. Our office only handles the bee side of it. Um, we, don't we don't really handle the honey production, bottling, and selling aspect of it. Um, that's, under, that's handled by the Texas Department of State Health Services. So in the current beekeeping laws, there is a section that speaks directly to the powers and duties of the chief apiary inspector. And as you read through this language, it can sound really intimidating. Um, but this language is in here for a very specific reason. Our office is responsible for controlling the spread of any pests or disease that can be damaging to the apiary industry. And so these capabilities of either preventing shipments or um, controlling a pest or eradicating, eradicating a pest if needed um, is a necessary step in order to protect the apiary industry. Today, any action listed here um, is specifically used in situations where we find a positive identification of American foul brood simply because it's a really Again, problematic disease for the industry. There is no treatment for it. It can spread really quickly. And so it's something that we don't want to spread 
to other beekeepers in the state or other beekeepers in the country. And so again, these power and powers and duties of the chief apiary inspector are here to only be used as necessary uh, in order to protect the industry. Under our, or to go alongside with our Texas Agricultural Code, Chapter 131, we have our Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 71, Bs. And these um, provide support to our, our beekeeping laws. Currently with our office, we have four inspectors. We have myself, we have Bill Baxter, the Assistant Chief Apiary Inspector, Hannah Blackburn and Taylor Warren, both of which are our apiary inspectors. And we are responsible for conducting inspections across the whole state of Texas. Again, with a small staff that we have here, we focus our inspections primarily on our commercial migratory beekeepers, but we, um, we will cater to any beekeeper. So as I mentioned before, on our inspections, um, we, are, we are primarily seeking out beekeepers that are moving in and out of the state. So our migratory and typically commercial beekeepers. We do inspections for other beekeepers that are maybe on the smaller scale. And typically those are requested inspections. So, um, you know, any beekeeper can call our office and say that they would like to have an inspector come out to look at their hives. And we're happy to work with beekeepers to set up a day and time to do that. Some beekeepers will request an inspection because they'd like to have a certificate of inspection issued from our office. Um, and that may, they may want that just because they're selling nukes or queens um, or queen cells. Um, an inspection is not required for selling bees or queens in the state of Texas. Um, but if you are not inspected, you are required to provide your customers with a signed health affidavit that states you haven't been inspected, but that you believe your bees to be disease free. Of course, we'll do emergency inspections as needed. So, um, you know, if we have a beekeeper that calls our office or emails our office and who is really concerned about something that they're seeing in their hive, um, we will talk to the beekeeper. We'll ask them to send us pictures of the issue that they're seeing. Kind of talk about the life history of the hive um, and then we will uh, depending on the situation if we determine that um, it's a problematic issue we will do an emergency inspection and we we do not charge for these types of inspections so with our office um, we have different permits for different types of movements that beekeepers do the import is for bringing hives into the state export is taking taking bees out of the state. The interstate permit, that's for moving bees across county lines. And this is an annual permit, whereas the import export permit is per movement per state. Under the interstate permit, we have what's called the bee removal transportation permit. And we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. We also have what we call a queen certificate or a queen inspection. What this is, it's a special inspection that we do primarily for our commercial queen breeders. And on this inspection, what we do is we take a look at their queen yards, and then we'll look at a few of their out yards where they may be producing drones. And we can we will issue them little uh, health certificate tags that they can place on their boxes when they're shipping queens, whether within the state or out of the state. So for bee removal, we mentioned this a little bit on the previous slide. But bee removal has be really taken off here in Texas, and the original intent behind it was when Africanized honeybees first came into the state, a lot of pest control operators did not want to handle those types of situations. Um, and so uh, beekeepers were provided this exemption under Chapter 1951 of the Structural Pest Control Law here in Texas that beekeepers are not required to have a pest control license in order to do bee removals. However, in order to do bee removals, they are required to register with our office. Bee removal itself is not regulated by, by our office since it is, a, it is a form of pest control. However, for beekeepers that are conducting removals in multiple counties, they are required to have what we call a bee removal transportation permit, which is the exact same thing as an intrastate permit. 
the reason we made a distinction between the two or or basically have the same permit under two different names is because with the bee removal transportation permit it allows us to determine or make sure that the beekeeper is compliant first of all underneath the pest control law and so we make sure that they're registered with our office and then on that permit the beekeeper just lists the counties that they want to operate in and we use that list to create the o overall list on our website for the general public to use um, if they're in need of, of a bee removal. So as I mentioned, our office maintains this list of beekeepers that are registered and, and have the permit with our office. And we do it as a public service to make sure that, um, you know, homeowners, landowners, property owners, etc., they have a beekeeper option to turn to if needed. On that web page, we do have a disclaimer um, at the top that explains, basically explains to the public how those beekeepers got on the list. And we've also provided uh, a document on that website, again, geared towards the general public, just kind of an FYI about bee removals, um, how to prepare for them, and then also, um, you know, when talking to beekeepers, some questions to ask beekeepers to make sure that they're finding someone who can fit their needs. So under our office, we um, also offer to beekeepers apiary registration. Registering your apiary locations is not required um, in the state of Texas, regardless of how many hives you have. It's completely voluntary. If you do decide to register with our office, it is free. And our form, the form is available on our website. So once you have that filled out, you can either you know email, mail, or fax it into our office, and we will issue a confirmation page to you that indicates that you know you've been registered with our office, and this is the date that we processed your registration. It's also a one-time thing, so you're not required to renew it on an annual basis. If you ever need to update your information or you want to update your APR locations, that's no problem at all. All you'd have to do is just resubmit the form and, and we can get that information updated for you. Beekeepers can also get what we call an equipment brand number and we have a registration form for that. There is a $10 fee for this type of registration. Again, it's completely voluntary to get a brand number from our office. Um, what this is, it's a unique identifying number assigned to the beekeeper by our office. So we generate this number and issue it to the beekeeper. What it looks like is it, the first number is always a one, then there's a dash, and then there's a three digit number, which is your county number. And this county number is based off of your um, home address as opposed to your apiary location. Um, and then the final number is what we call is your beekeeper number. And this is really the unique part of the number. Um, so for example, if I'm the first beekeeper in Brazos County to uh, get a brand number, mine would be one dash Brazos County number dash zero zero one. And then the next beekeeper to get a brand after me would be one dash the Brazos County number dash zero zero two and so on and so forth. And so that beekeeper number is a sequential number within each county. So in Texas, under our current laws, um, technically a, a beekeeper is required to identify their hives. And a beekeeper can do so either by placing their name and contact information on the outside of the boxes or by using this brand number. And we understand that branding equipment can be Kind of expensive especially if you have you know one or two hives it's, it doesn't really make sense to get um, get branding equipment so either stenciling or painting your information on the outside of your boxes is totally fine i wouldn't recommend using a sharpie or permanent marker just because the sun will uh, fade that really quickly but stenciling painting it on are great substitutes so that's the general gist of our current beekeeping laws. Like I said, a lot of it pertains to our migratory beekeepers, you know, those permits of going out of the state or moving hives around the, around the state. 
um, very little bit has to do with smaller scale operations. But of course, we provide a service to all beekeepers. So, um, you know, whether you have one hive or 10,000, you know, we're happy to be a resource here for you. So now I want to hop into talking a little bit about history of inspections and inspection services and just some of the other activities and projects that we're involved in. So to start off, I like to give this little introduction into, you know, the significant pest events that have occurred in the apiary industry over time. Starting off in 1910, you know, that's when our office was formed specifically to combat American fowl brood. Then in 1984, we had the introduction of tracheal mites. Tracheal mites we don't really see anymore. It doesn't seem to be a major issue for beekeepers, um, but they definitely were when they were first introduced. And then in 1987, we had the introduction of varroa mites, and, you know, it's still a major issue for beekeepers today. Then in 1990, we had the introduction of Africanized honeybees. In 2006, we started hearing the term colony collapse disorder. And then I like to put question marks after that because it's never ending. There's always something new out there that we don't have here in the United States, but other countries do and are dealing with. And we just have to be aware of it and be prepared. A great example is the Asian giant hornet. Uh, so last year we had the, in 2019, we had the introduction of the Asian giant hornet Vespa mandarinia into Washington state and then also in Canada. And this can be a really problematic pest for honeybee colonies. And it's an issue that both Washington state and Canada are contending with at this time. But, you know, that's not the only thing that's out there. There's plenty of other pests and disease issues that we fortunately don't have here in the United States, and I hope we never have. But I think it's really important for beekeepers to be aware of potential issues and to be vigilant. So, you know, we have all these major pest introductions over time. Um, but at the same time, there's also been an increase in demand for honeybee pollination. We've seen this boom in the agricultural industry uh, and need for, for bees to pollinate these crops. An example that I really love using is almond pollination, primarily because it's such a significant event in the beekeeping year. At least as of 2017, California had about uh, 1 million bearing acres, and that's just the bearing acres of almonds. In order to pollinate this number of acreage of almond trees, they need about 1.7 million honeybee colonies. That's about half the colonies in the United States. So pretty significant event. We have about you know, half of the colonies moving from, you know, all the way from the East Coast out to California for about two months just for pollination. And then afterwards, they disperse across the country for honey production, other pollination, for building up their hives, raising queens, raising bees, etc. It has been estimated that we will see an increase and are seeing an increase in the number, not only the number of bearing acres, but also the need for the number of hives in the future. So suffice to say, we've seen a lot of changes in the, in the beekeeping world and the industry um, within the last few years, within recent history. Currently, there's about a little over two and a half million colonies in the United States. And every beekeeper is facing challenges on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that, you know, they're sustainably keeping their bees, they're maintaining healthy colonies. And so new methods need to be found uh, and created in order to at least, not only just to sustain the number of colonies we have, but hopefully to increase it so we can meet this demand. And so we need some novel solutions for the industry in order to support our beekeepers. So some of these new solutions have stemmed through inspection services. 
And the reason for that is because we can act as this bridge, this liaison between beekeepers and the research world. You know, our job is heavily involved in seeing beekeepers and talking to them about the issues that they're seeing in their operations and the challenges that they're having in, in, or in maintaining their operations. And we can ask them, you know, what, what they want to see more research in. And we can take that information back to the research side and hopefully inspire new research projects that are beneficial to the industry. On the flip side of that, you know, we also interact with researchers. We're paying attention to any new research that comes out. And we can take that back to the beekeepers and say, you know, hey, here's a, you know, a new study that came out about et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, because they don't always have the time to sit down and look at new research. So we can bring it to them and, and talk about it. Some of the other new solutions that inspection services are a part of and, and that ours here in Texas are a part of is with the Be Informed Partnership. They specifically have uh, tech, tech, what we call tech transfer teams. And what these teams are, they are essentially crop consultants, but for beekeepers. So they work really closely with primarily commercial beekeepers, migratory beekeepers, and take a really deep dive into their operations to see you know, what pests and disease issues are they having? What um, other management challenges are they having? And, you know, can collect all this data and detailed information and kind of assess it and talk to a beekeeper, to the beekeeper about where they can potentially improve and in, with the goal of managing healthier hives. Our office also collaborates with several different researchers at the university level, at the federal level. Specifically, for the past uh, about 10 years, uh, we have been participating in the USDA National Honeybee Survey. What this is, it's a project where it's that several states, almost the entire United States, is participating in this. What we do is we get a set of sampling boxes, and when we're out doing inspections, we collect samples, both samples of live honeybees, samples of honeybees in alcohol, and sometimes we'll collect pollen samples or wax samples. But in the end, the goal is to study these these hives, and again, this is covering the entire United States, but collecting samples from all these different hives and setting them on their pests and disease levels, um, virus levels, any, is there, are we seeing any resistance to specific miticides? Um, and this information is available online um, for anyone to access, and I highly encourage you to, to check it out. And you can even narrow down to see specifically what's going on in Texas and how have trends changed or not changed over over the time. So over time, you know, we've had, again, all these introductions of different pests, problems. Um, we've seen this increase in demand for beekeeping and pollination, but we've also seen a increase in beekeeping uh, specifically at the small scale level. And here in Texas, we don't, since we don't require apiary registration, we don't actually know how many beekeepers we have here in the state. But I typically, typically estimate that we have about five to 6,000 beekeepers here at any given time. And I think that's a safe estimate. One of the really positive things that has come out of this boom in beekeeping, specifically at the small scale level, is that anyone can be a beekeeper. You can have, you know, whatever career you want to have, and you can also be a beekeeper. And I think that really speaks to the industry as a whole uh, and can bring a lot of benefits to it because you're bringing people from all different types of backgrounds, all different perspectives, all different areas of interests, and looking it at one insect. And I think having such a diversity of people within an industry can really lead to some really some of those novel solutions 
um, and improvements in management of, of bees. So because of this increase in popularity of beekeeping, we've kind of had to adjust what our role is and the services that we provide. So not only do we provide or conduct health inspections for beekeepers, um, but we've also kind of taken on this role of providing information to both beginning beekeeping audiences, but also non-beekeepers. So we work with Extension, we talk to homeowners, municipalities, agricultural clubs, you name it, we probably talk to them. And we've just become really tied into these other areas um, that are outside of the apiary industry. One of the major changes that we've made is providing education for small-scale operations. So we typically um, like to present at major bee schools and conferences, um, talking to beekeepers not only about our beekeeping laws, but uh, anything really bee health related. Um, or, you know, if you have a question about any beekeeping topic in general, we're, we're happy to talk about it. On our website, we have a section dedicated specifically to different pests and diseases. I encourage you to check that out. We also provide on our website um, a best management practices guide that our office created. And these are just suggestions. They're not required uh, for beekeepers to follow, but they're just kind of um, guidelines, I guess, for safe beekeeping and, uh, and also managing healthy hives. But there's a lot of other resources there for beekeepers, but also for the general public. So there's a little bit of something for everyone on our website. And here is a picture of our homepage of our website. Um, our website is txbeeinspection.tamu.edu. On the right-hand side, you'll see an icon that says, give us a buzz. If you were to click on that, um, it would take you to a page where you would enter your name and your email address or phone number. And, and then it has a space where you can write anything to us. <laughs> doesn't have to be a question. It can be a comment um, or a good bee joke, good bee story, whatever, uh, whatever suits your fancy. And anyway, it's just kind of an easy, quick and easy way to get in contact with us. Um, but you'll see also on this page that we have, um, a, there's a tab titled Regulations. That, that is where you can find a copy of both Chapter 131, our laws, and then Chapter 71, our rules. Um, and there's also a recording of this presentation there that's about 15 minutes. <laughs> so if you need something to lull you to sleep at night, you can just tune in there. Um, forms and fees is where you'll find all of our permit applications, but also a form for APR registration and the application for a brand number. And then we have our section for beekeepers and then for the general public. The bee removal tab is where we provide our list. Um, and so anybody can, can access all that information. Under our four beekeeper section, you'll see there's quite a, quite, quite a lot of information listed there, but I specifically clicked on the pests and disease section, um, and then pulled out, um, the section on American Falbird. So, but we list, you know, all the pests and diseases that you can find here in the United States. Um, and I think that's a great resource for beekeepers just to check out and just be aware of just in case you need it. So as we look to the future, you know, we will continue doing our, our health inspections. Um, and on those, we will continue monitoring for not only the pests and diseases that we have here already, but also anything new. And of course, we'll continue to promote and support any educational program that we can. And then we would like to continue to work with NGOs, other research groups, um, the USDA, um, in the, with the hope and the goal of improving honeybee health. Thank you for your time and your attention. If you ever need to get in contact with us, our main office line and email address is right there. And please reach out if you have any questions or comments. And again, thank you for your time.